Good day and welcome to Patton's Behavior Bites Coffee Break. Today we will be discussing best practices learned during the 2020 school year. Let's return to school but not to the same old practices. The mission of the Pennsylvania Training and Technical Assistance Network, also known as Patton, is to support the efforts and initiatives of the Bureau of Special Education and to build the capacity of local educational agencies to serve students who receive special education services. Our goal for each child is to ensure that IEP, Individualized Education Program, team begins with the general education setting with the use of supplementary aids and services before considering a more restrictive environment. Our learning targets for today will be focusing on the family, caregiver, communication and partnering, digital resources and approaches, and lastly, student engagement and ownership. One very powerful takeaway from the 2021 school year was our adaptability and the success that we had in reaching the adults in the household of our students. We did it during the pandemic, and we surely can continue that even when we return to -to face-to-face classroom instruction. Some of the many things we did that worked, districts more effectively use their websites and emails. Teachers also created class-based websites that were easily accessible by both the adult in the household as well as the student. Whether we were asynchronous learners, completely virtual, completely in face-to-face, these resources were accessible by all. Uh, Teachers created sites, we had text alerts, also the app uh, known as Seesaw, uh, something that I'll highlight in the next slide, but also alternate school hours. The rest of the world does not have a fifth period. We have first shift, we have second shift, we have third shift. Schools were able to adapt, meet with parents and caregivers earlier in the morning, later in the afternoon, and we were able to communicate to have those conferences or a a needed touch point with regard to the status of their learner. Seesaw is an app that on a smaller scale is free, but on a larger scale, they they can scale it up where there's a a cost associated with it. But this app is something that if the adult in the household or actually additional, if there's a a grandparent, that if they have the, the QR code or the link to this app, they will receive class notifications from the teacher, but also specific audio, video, pictures captured by their student of their work or their projects that they can send directly to their grown-ups that are associated with their account. There is a filter. Uh, The filter is the classroom teacher that while the student can post something, the teacher has to view and approve it. Similarly, when the adult wants to respond, uh, via text or you know a thumbs up, that post is pending until the teacher sees and approve, approves of such comments. But what this does do is it gets immediate feedback with regard to the quote unquote, what did you do today? It's shared immediately by the student or in mass with if there's a guest speaker or a project going on by the teacher themselves. Something to consider. The phenomenal resources that we provided and used with households during COVID and during 2021 school year should continue to be utilized moving forward. The free sites with no username and password, things that might even flirt with fun, should still be utilized and shared. Uh, A syllabus with unit goals that are accessible by the family. Uh, the household, that they can see where we are in the month of October, what we're moving toward and focusing on. Uh, One pagers on accessing digital sites and resources that's provided in multiple languages. Again, UDL showing accessibility, making sure that they know what's available, what's accessible, pulling them in as a partner in the learning. It's what we did during the COVID pandemic, and it's what we should continue to do moving forward. 
a site that you might want to share with both teachers and parents and caregivers would be Common Sense Media. It's commonsensemedia.org. It has a tab for parents, for educators, as well as for advocates. And this is a, a site where you can preview and see what books and games and movies are age appropriate, what the content is, and the like. It's a great resource trying to keep up with what we're doing in the classroom as well as what our students are doing outside of the classroom and at home. Again, helping the partner to raise and educate our youth. Digital resources and working virtually or asynchronously has absolutely been one of the strengths that universally everybody has excelled at and grown from where they were prior to the 2021 school year. So let's build upon those successes. Now what we don't want to do is live in an either or situation. We either do virtual or face to face. What we want to do is enhance the classroom discussion and the face to face experience with digital resource and asynchronous learning opportunities. Classroom discussion is unquestionably the largest effect size at 0.82. Summarization and teacher clarity, 0.79, 0.75. These things are part and parcel of both components, both of the virtual classroom setting as well as the face to face. Explicit, explicit teaching strategies and problem solving, all part and parcel, all nested together. We need to think about these things as a both and as we look at the digital resources. One resource that Patton has to offer uh, addresses the mathematical standards development and progression chart. This is going pre-K through high school, addressing both uh, all four of the categories, numbers and operations algebraic concepts, geometry, as well as measurement data and probability. Now what you see in this slide, you see the boxes sitting in the different cells associated with numbers and operations, fractions, or the number system, etc., etc. Those are hyperlinks in the document. There's a Word document where those are hyperlinks that will take you to a site that is, has no fee, no username, no password, but it is a digital resource addressing geometry, numbers and operations in the different grade bands. This is something that we believe strongly in utilizing regardless of whether you're face-to-face -face or asynchronous or virtual. They're great resources and these can also be shared with the household of our students and they can see how these things work and they can work with their children alongside what you're doing in the classroom. But again, with the Hattie effect size, it's imperative that the direct instruction on how they're utilized, how we communicate, the vocabulary we use, it is essential that the classroom teacher drives the instruction and fosters the knowledge and the capability to utilize these tools effectively. Another resource, uh, shifting gears from the mathematical standards to the ELA standards, Noodle Tools. It's a research tool that has a junior feature for students. It'll address MLA or APA style. It is a two-pronged approach. It is designed to assist the teacher with effective and proactive teaching, setting up to start teaching quickly and easily, uh, no advertising, student-friendly privacy policy, but with regard to the student learning, it's a student's research companion. It's aiding them in citing their, their resources and sources in MLA, APA, and Chicago style. Um, collaborate in real time from anywhere. It's, um, it is not free, but it is a reasonable expense depend, uh, depending on the course you're teaching and the use of it. But when you get into the research writing component of the ELA, let's utilize some resources that'll help them as they move on and better prepare them for post-secondary education and, uh, and the like. I wanna make sure that you realize these are not opinions. They are in fact facts. 
multiple representations to teach mathematics, whether they're physical manipulatives or virtual manipulatives, impacts the conceptual understanding. Similarly, instead of talking about how to do citations and how to do a research paper and how to give uh, recognition to where you are pulling your information, using a tool that they learn while doing makes much more sense. It makes it applicable. It's real-time learning and the use thereof. So these things tie in both in the mathematical but also with the ELA and the Noodle tools. These are learning skill sets from the cradle to the grave. When they embrace and learn how to research what tools they need to use, pick and choose judiciously when and where to use these tools, when and where to use citations, and write in a certain format or persuasive or research and the like, these skill sets will transcend ninth grade. 12th grade, high school, college. It, they are lifelong skills that we can use, but we want to be very explicit in how we are engaging with them, both with the teacher, the student, and the household caregiver. While the virtual manipulative usage and implementation can be very impactful, it cannot be overstressed the importance of the classroom instructor again referencing the Hattie effect size, with how we implement them and how we're clear in our instruction. What is eight cut in half as opposed to how many halves goes into eight versus what is eight divided by a half? And at this point in time, I want to make sure that we understand that I'm about to tease and make fun a little of your curricular resources while they are really well intended. Worksheets versus hands-on versus virtual simulation. This is where the art of teaching, when you step in with the direct clear instruction, when you pull them in whole group for a summarization and a recap, when they are off on their own. It's a judicious dance. It's understanding when and where to use the tools and how to be effective. For example, this is an actual worksheet from an actual curricular resource. While well-intentioned, I, I completely understand it was well-intentioned. What we are looking at here is a teaspoon in the upper left-hand corner, which seems to be slightly larger than a two-liter bottle on the right. That does not help us with estimation. That does not help learners understand scale and the metric system. We move down, we have number one is a soda can, which makes no sense in Western Pennsylvania, only in the Eastern region. It's larger than the shampoo bottle or the dish soap bottle. And number two, and number three, when I look at it, I see a coat hanger with a beach towel hanging on it. If you did not actually engage in World War II and have a water canteen of that nature, number three is really odd visually, and it is not smaller than a can of Coke or Pepsi. While it's well-intentioned to pretend that these are engaging and showing real-world world examples, they're just not. This is not helpful. What we really want to do, instead of being dependent upon curricular resources that, while well-intentioned, are creating gross misunderstandings in our learners, we want to actually use a two-liter bottle, a one-liter bottle, a can of pop, get those things right here that we can see, touch, hold, compare. If it's a virtual setting, take a picture of it. Use your smartphone, take a picture, take a video of how much fluid comes out of a 12 ounce can as compared to, et cetera, et cetera. Estimation 180 and three act math. These resources, if you Google DY Dan or Ms. Dan Meyer, you'll come up with the three act math at blog.mrmeyer.com. These are phenomenal resources, no username, no password, but they are not meant to be independent learner. Just click on these and just, just watch these. Nope. 
This has to be facilitated by the adult in the classroom where you introduce Act 1, you facilitate discussion, the students are writing things down, they're making their estimations, etc., and you move through it. There is learning to be done. There are several IU TAC across the state that have training in this. There are patent consultants that would be delighted if you reached out to get further into virtual manipulatives, uh, the estimation 180, any of the things we're touching on here today. But these are resources that are far more engaging and illuminating in real time on a very low budget. Another example, well-intentioned, I'm, I'm not intending to throw too many stones from my glass house, but this would be under the category of a real world problem in many geometric texts. And it is a real world problem, it's just not very applicable to most 16 to 18 year olds. It's true, not relevant, not, I dare say, not engaging. What if we address it with a clinometer? You can buy it. They're the relatively inexpensive plastic models. You can download the app. You can make it yourself. You can actually have the students make it. It involves either a straw, a pencil or a pen. You have your protractor, a piece of string, and some type of a washer, and you can make it or since this is a digital section, you can download a free app. There are physical ones that you can purchase uh, anywhere from 12 to $30. And you can, by changing the height of it, uh, the angle of it, it just, it reads the angle of elevation. There's also a tilt meter, kind of an interesting term. It's, it's called a clinometer. Uh, the app store, they can put it on their iPad if you, if you have a one-to-one, -one, if you have a cart or a classroom set, and you can work in groups. You teach this, again, you can show the usefulness of it when you're having a debate about whether their school picture or the painting on the wall is level. If you have this app on your phone, you simply put it on the top of the picture to see if it reads zero. You can also put it on the edge going vertically, and now we have another whole conversation about slope. It's engaging. That's actually useful. Not a lot of high school students cutting down trees. We can use technology to engage in the mathematics. The curriculum versus the curricular resource, we want to make sure that we're using consistent vocabulary across the board with ELA. Uh, the fact is, when we you spend several years saying it's a describing word, describing word, four syllables, adjective, three syllables, we could just tell them what it is. It's an adjective, and an adjective is described uh, is a describing word. Um, I am an advocate for not watering down the terminology, expose them to it, use both of them consistently, whether it's math, ELA, science, art, etc. Our third learning target that we're going to address today is student and teacher shared ownership of learning. The notion that learning doesn't happen to you. The 2021 school year, we fully embraced a shared ownership where the student knew and was engaged in what they had submitted, what they had not submitted. We had better communication with the household and the grown-ups in the household as to where the learner was. Were they on track? Did they have their assignments in? Were they missing uh, a check-in or an exit ticket or the like? We want to make sure that when we go back to face-to-face in-class instruction that we do not go back to this mentality of we are doing it to you. It is a joint venture in learning and growing. In the 2021 school year, we had new roles and responsibilities, newly defined roles and responsibilities, and they worked well. I believe we need to continue with that moving forward in the face-to-face -face setting or an asynchronous learning situation. The teacher provides a syllabus for the year. Again, we're not holding back which chapters, which units, what topics we're going to do for the year. This is what we are going to cover in our time together. These are the big ideas we will work to learn and to fully grasp conceptually. And these are the approximate timelines we're hoping to hit. 
We might move faster, we might move a little slower, but this is approximately what we're looking at. Instruction, we had office hours. We had direct instruction time and we had office hours. That could be something that continues when we have a face-to-face -face setting where it could be online, online chat, post a question. Uh, it, it could be uh, instead of a study hall setting, we have an office hour setting where we can address some questions via the classroom website. And we can provide up-to-date records of grades and formative assessments. Those can be accessed by the household at any time, the caregiver at any time, the student at any time. They don't need to come to you, the font of knowledge, to know What's my grade right now? Am I missing any assignments? No, it's shared ownership. This is a shared document. You know where you are. I know where you are. And, and there's responsibility and there's onus on the student as well as the teacher. Similarly, this, on the right-hand column, that student is then tasked and expected to keep track. At all grade levels, they can keep track. In the lower grades, they can keep track of their reading fluency. How many words per minute are they? And they're keeping a track of that. And then next week when the assessment, they track that. You have your grade book, but they are well aware of how quickly they're accomplishing things. They are well aware if they have mastered their sixes times table or where they are on their research paper that is due November 10th and the like. Um, engaging with instruction and add, uh, accessing additional supports, the student has the ownership of needing to be responsible. Do I have this? I know there's a quiz Thursday and how am I going to do? If I fully understand it, if I have all the spelling words memorized, if I know all the contributing factors to World War II, then I'm good. If I don't, then I need to access some of these additional supports. I need to access some office hours, etc. It's not happening to the student. They are fully engaged, they are fully accountable, and, and it, it is a partnership with the instructor and the student, and we are including the family, that they are, they are also in the know. They can access it at any time. The SIM Unit Organizer, SIM standing for Strategic Instructional Model, this is out of the University of Kansas. This is a potential tool that would help in what we were just discussing with regard to the shared ownership of what we're discussing, what we were just learning in the previous unit, what's coming up, timelines and expectations. There are several IU TAC across the state of Pennsylvania as well as patent consultants across the state who are well versed in this and can add additional training at any time if requested. This is what it looks like. Page one, you can see down the left-hand column in the, the uh, section called eight, unit schedule. Those are some tentative dates. What we're covering, the, the pages that are covered. There's a quiz on 128. We're moving along, there seems to be another quiz on 130. And you can tell what it's on and there'll be a test February 8th on, on 2-8. So we've got that mapped out. Now if there's a fire drill or a snow day, okay, there's latitude. But right there, we can see what's going on with our unit schedule. Up in the, the cell number two, that's what we did learn or discuss and learn in the previous unit. Number three is what's coming next. And number one, right in the center, that's what we're doing right now and focusing on. And we can map this out as we go, but that left-hand column lets them know what's coming up and they are then held accountable for the learning to be prepared and for those assessments. Page two of the unit organizer, the back side, you can see the graphic organizer where they've broken down the causes of the Civil War. One, they're saying it's about sectionalism, but within sectionalism, they've broken that down into four larger areas the geographical areas of the U.S., the differences between those areas, events occurring within in the United States, and leaders of change. So what this is doing, it again is facilitated by the teacher, whole class. We're putting down what we think would break down and fill into these four larger ideas that help define sectionalism that was a major contributing factor to the cause of the Civil War. 
we are now teaching students to break larger concepts into smaller, more manageable bite-sized components that they can then retain and they can also study for doing a research paper, but they can also see where this is applicable to other fields, other areas of study, and their career choice. The student-centered approach, this is our goal. We want self-reflection to lead to self-awareness. We want the self-awareness to lead to self-efficacy, the belief that they can succeed. The self-efficacy will lead to the self-advocacy where they can actually speak up, advocate, put themselves in a position to be successful. It all stems from the first portion of self-reflection. We need to model it as the adult in the room. We need to be explicit with the, the large Hattie effect size and we need to teach it and be consistent in it throughout the year. This is where we want our learners to be. That is the ultimate goal. Leverage the digital. Many recorded lessons, shared drives, classroom websites. We want to leverage these resources as we build that self-advocacy within our students. In conclusion, we, the collective we, have done great things in the 2021 school year. It is essential that we continue with those best practices. We want to build upon them. We want to do even better than what we did in the past. But it is absolutely important to realize and acknowledge and reflect on the great things that have been accomplished during the 2021 school year and a global pandemic. I cannot thank you enough for all the great things you have done in this past year and the great things you will do moving forward. My name is Bob Shields. I'm a patent educational consultant. This has been just a bite of behavior and I look forward to working with you and talking with you in the future.